You're listening to a CNA podcast. Hello, everybody. It's Otelli Edwards here for another special episode of Deep Dive. Now, I'm sure you've read it or perhaps even seen it online, a video circulating on social media that has pretty much gone viral. I'm talking about what happened last Saturday when a car fell into a sinkhole along Tanjung Katong Road. Now, one minute we see it, it was there, and the next it looked like the road opened up and the car with the driver in it was like swallowed whole and the car basically disappeared. And thankfully, the driver managed to exit the car and was rescued by some very brave construction workers who basically rushed to her rescue. Obviously, you know, it's been a few days and the internet has been full of questions. Generally, how did sinkholes happen and what does it have to do with our underground construction work? And also, does it have anything to do with climate change? Here with me are two gentlemen who are here to explain a little bit more about sinkholes to us. First up, Dr. Stefan Chua. He's Research Assistant Professor at the Earth Observatory of Singapore in NTU. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks for having me. And we also have David Ng. He's Chairman of the Civil and Structural Engineering Technical Committee at the Institution of Engineers Singapore. Welcome to you both. Hi, everyone. Okay, gentlemen, help us understand this first, right, in terms of how sinkholes are formed. Firstly, would you say there's any difference um, between a natural sinkhole that's caused by weather and one that's perhaps caused by human activities uh, like construction? Stefan, perhaps you want to start first? As a geologist, I would say that it's both because the processes are the same and the processes are typically natural. It's basically water or dissolution of underground rock or sediments. So that's the natural part. But man-made part is when you apply human construction, human developments on that area, which means that you're talking about instead of a natural hillside, a natural slope, a natural plain, you have roads and buildings being affected. So it is a natural phenomenon but in a man-made situation, then it becomes a man-made problem or engineering problem in some cases. Oh, David, an engineering problem? You'd second that? Yeah, we do see quite a lot of number of sinkholes that actually are related to construction activities, which is uh, engineering works. So yeah, I, I don't deny that. But there are actually many mitigation measures that actually we put in whenever we do such underground work that is most likely the one to cause any potential sinkhole to, to occur, which is uh, what we can see in the past. There have been a number of sinkholes that has occurred that is actually related to uh, construction activities such as underground construction, underground deep excavation and tunneling works and so on. We have seen sinkholes in various sizes. One of the ones that was quite vivid in our memory, I think, would be that sinkhole we saw in Malaysia where the woman basically slipped in and fell. And it looked like it was a round, rather small sinkhole. And then the one we saw, the most recent one along um, Tanjung Kadung was quite a massive one. So in a nutshell, right, what actually determines the size of a sinkhole? There are many factors at play, but more or less you can look at it as the size of the underground space. The more underground space that's being eroded by water or dissolved by water, the larger the potential sinkhole. Of course, it also depends on the overburden, how much weight is on top. So mm -hmm. if you put them together, it's just about how much space at the bottom, how much weight at the top. That will kind of determine how big the cavity is for the sinkhole to develop. David, in your experience, when engineers, when you have to have this tough job of making sure that sinkholes don't happen, help us understand what are some of the challenges involved? I mean, how could something like this be prevented? Well, we can see that the construction activities that are related to potential sinkhole are actually underground construction. The problem is that such underground construction will actually uh, lead to some potential void being formed underground. So from a void that could be created as a result of the construction, for example, some of the soil and water may have leaked into the deep excavation site. So Whatever soil that has come in, it will left behind a void. This void may eventually propagate to become bigger. It will near to the surface of the road and actually where the cave in may occur. So such void may also be created by tunneling works using tunneling machine. Uh, when it overcuts more than the volume of soil that is supposed to cut, by right, it's supposed to just cut a cylindrical shape to construct the dark tunnel, but then it may overcut more, such as sometimes you encounter some unexpected ground condition that is... Uh, loose sand filled with water. So when we cut through it, 
such water and sand will just flow into the tunnel boring machine and a void is formed, uh, sometimes without us knowing it. Time, and this void may eventually slowly propagate. Now, so just now you asked about the question, how do we know how big such void is and so on, right? Yeah, how do we, how do we prevent, uh, you know, from some, something like this happening again? So the void can grow quite big, but it's just that when we discover it, because the void may happen, may exist in the ground for some time. And then it, it's just like initially you may have uh, some thickness of soil on top and the thickness of root on top where your vehicle and uh, human walking past is like a bridge that you can still support, but below is actually void. But it will, this soil below will slowly drop down, continue to drop down because of gravity. And it becomes so thin that it's just like a piece of paper. Then it cannot take any more load on top. So anyone that walk on it or a car that go on it will just cause a spoil to cave in. In construction activities that we are doing, uh, we are very careful to prevent such void from forming at first. If we want to prevent sinkhole, we, we must prevent the void from forming. So we have to install adequately robust retaining wall to prevent soil and water from coming into the excavation. And during the ball tunneling work, we also have to put in a lot of precautionary measures. We call it a key performance indicator that we monitor very closely during the tunneling work to make sure that we don't over-excavate more than what we need so that they will eliminate the risk of forming the void underground that will eventually grow big and become a sinkhole. Stefan, you know, given mm. the um, increasing uh, intensity of rainfall that we have seen and, and also the, the prevalence of all this underground infrastructure uh, development in Singapore, are there certain early warning signs you are currently missing or perhaps um, underestimating that could lead into perhaps more uh, frequent or larger sinkholes in the future? Going back to what David has said, indeed, engineering solutions have been able to mitigate against a lot of these risks. So related to your question, right? So, for example, oversaturated soils. Because right now, what David is mentioning is indeed seems to be the major sinkhole cause in urbanized environments over the last 20 years. Basically, water leakage. And water leakage can be managed, can be monitored. The thing that cannot really be mitigated against is precipitation either through heavy rainfall or in other countries through ice melt. This one is tricky because based on what we know and what we can forecast, we're going to have more intense rainfalls for longer. Water can travel over land or underground. Depends on how impervious the surface is. That means soils will stay wet and saturated and therefore weaker for longer. Mm. And of course, the second thing is the water table. I think the water table in Singapore is often very shallow. The water table is basically a layer of water that sits under in equilibrium with the air and ground pressures. So it's there. So any form of rainfall patterns or sea level rise can actually cause this water level to come up and down, affecting some of the weaknesses mm. underground. So hearing what Stefan has said, um, David, I'm curious to know from an engineering perspective, right, adaptation, how are current monitoring protocols, for instance, adapting to these escalating risks? You know, I mean, are the protocols keeping up? In fact, we already have very detailed monitoring program for each of these uh, underground construction work. We have a usual regime of instrumentation that's quite comprehensively planned. For example, we have settlement markers to monitor the ground settlement. Uh, we also have inclinometer to monitor lateral movement of the soil, potential lateral movement. And we also have piezometer installed in the ground to monitor the groundwater pressure changes. So these are the key instruments that will actually monitor the behavior of the ground if there's any changes. For example, if there's a large water flow or water leak, there will be changes in the groundwater pressure that we will expect to see and such instrument will be able to pick up. And then if there's any ground movement, lateral ground movement, the inclinometer that you saw in the, this, uh, a tube that we put into the ground will be able to pick up this movement as well. And there will be related settlement that can be picked up by the settlement marker. Therefore, all this comprehensive and holistic way of instrumentation and monitoring is actually quite comprehensive. And I would say that in any deep excavation and tunneling work for underground construction, we should be able to pick up any kind of early sign of movement. And then if we find there's any unusual type of movement that's excessive, uh, we will immediately look into it and investigate further. So actually, off air, Stefan, you mentioned something quite interesting that actually different parts of Singapore, the ground that we're standing on is sort of made up of different granite and some spots are just a bit more, would you say, hardier than, you know, like the east versus the west. So give us some examples of that. So... Engineers in Singapore, geologists, we know Singapore is what we call a juxtaposition of different geological units. 
their outcrop. That means they are the surface units. Where you are, Telly, right now, uh, you're... Yeah, we're north. <laughs> Tell me, how, how sturdy? What strong <laughs> grounds am I on? <laughs> well, you're typically on silt and sandstone. Lithified, oh. Triassic age. We estimate from zircon aging two to 300 million years old, folded sandstone. So pretty tough. Uh, mm-hmm. From an engineering standpoint, I'll leave David to answer that. Yeah, but, Randolph have a very deep basement, yes. right? Uh, it has a five basement or six basement below. Yes. So we have to dig very deep and there's a station there as well. So the ground mm-hmm. there is very good. So I'll tell you, you are, you are safe You're there. Safe. Very the safe. east side? The east, I don't want to qualify. So this is the natural subsurface. So in the east, you have this kind of unconsolidated sands, muds, silts, uh, somewhat consolidated in the far east, not so much consolidated in some of the areas in and around the Kalang River Basin. These are our younger sediments, and I would just say they're not as sturdy and not as consolidated. But the fortunate thing is we do not have easily dissolvable rock types like gypsum, chalk, salt, or limestone that is prevalent in other countries. We don't uh, have it here as much. So we are pretty good. The thing is about 25% of the land in Singapore is reclaimed land, right? So uh, can we say that these areas are also more vulnerable than others? I mean, can we make that assumption? And if so, what's being done to strengthen the area that's formed by reclaimed land? David? In Singapore, our ground conditions mostly are competent. Even at the reclaimed land, like you said, 25% of our Singapore land are reclaimed land. But all our reclaimed land are engineered. So they are not a natural dumping reclaimed land. So Mm. we actually do a lot of engineering work. For example, we do ground improvement to plan for the consolidation of the clay by planning how much thickness of the sand to be placed on it. And then we also do some of the ground improvement work, such as flotation. It means we vibrate the sand to make the sand more dense. And then we also put prefabricated vertical drain for, to let the, the water from the clay to drain out, to let the clay consolidate faster. So most of the area of the reclaimed land, including Singapore, uh, Jurong Island, uh, Tuas, uh, including Changi Terminal 5 area, the whole of Changi reclaimed area, are all engineered. To me, it's a different kind of engineering challenge that we have to design the mm. right solution to build something there. doesn't mean that reclaimed land is actually riskier and uh, having more risk of sinkhole formation. Actually, not true. The other thing as well, that because, you know, Singapore, we have obviously scarcity of land and, and we have to go underground. And there is this underground master plan that we've been talking about. So moving our rail lines, utilities, warehousing, storage, all of that stuff underground. If that's the direction that we are moving into, what is the key thing that engineers should be mindful about? One of the key things when we are doing underground construction is to make sure that the surrounding is not adversely affected. So this can be done in various stages. It starts from all the way from planning and design stage. So we have to do a lot of impact assessment to actually assess all the structures that's around or adjacent to the excavation site mm-hmm. or tunneling site that we are doing work. So we need to make sure that uh, we do very detailed computer program analysis to model the whole work, and then including the construction sequence to estimate what kind of movement are we expecting for, for example, the nearby water pipe, the nearby building, to ensure that this movement will be acceptable before we confirm that the design is good to go for construction. So such uh, work is being done rigorously. When it comes to construction, we also have very tight regime of supervision team on site to ensure that things are go according to the approved design and they can't deviate. And then we also have uh, put in a lot of monitoring and instrumentation to actually monitor the ground behaviour to ensure that the performance of the ground is according to what we have expected and in line with it. If any deviation, then we have to really investigate. When we saw what happened to the car in that sinkhole, right, um, I think there were a lot of netizens, they were freaking out, right, especially the people who are living in that area. So the surrounding buildings around there, does it put those areas at risk? Because... You know, if you see a sinkhole that's 50 to 100 metres away from you, I mean, you're thinking, oh, then is that going to come to me? In natural settings, sinkholes do enlarge. And in some situations, as David was mentioning, cars, landforms, sinkhole can deepen. But Singapore, I don't think we would have that problem because the roads are heavily engineered. They are also very systematically monitored. Once you put proper retaining walls to ensure the moisture doesn't enter the system, it should be well contained. I don't know if it sounds like a ridiculous question, but I mean, for the average driver, pedestrian out there, you know, when you're crossing the road or you're trying to drive, is it even possible to look out for potential sinkholes or it's just impossible? 
Uh, maybe let me add on to what uh, Dr. Steven has mentioned just now. It's unlikely that the sinkhole uh, will usually deepen because we are not in the karstic uh, limestone area, but there is an influence zone that we are looking at. So like, it's just like earthquake, there's, a, there's an epicenter, and then it will dissipate, become smaller and smaller as the ripple uh, opens up in a circular manner. So this uh, sinkhole is a similar condition where once the sinkhole occurs uh, at the location of the sinkhole, typically we are looking at a radius of three times the depth of the crater to be the influence zone that will be affected by the sinkhole, which means that area in this influence zone, we are expecting some soil movement that will be moving towards this crater because there's a void there. For sure, there will be some movement that is moving towards this void. So this area of uh, three times, for example, the crater is 10 meters, so at most we are looking at a 30 meter radius all around the center of this uh, sinkhole. That is the area of concern. That, that's what I think now you are seeing that uh, the authorities are actually closing up the area. That is actually the area influence zone, and they are doing a lot of uh, investigation there to ensure that on shallow area there's no void, and in deeper area there's also no void by doing GPR scanning, by doing probing, and so on. If the area within the influence zone is safe, beyond that, there's no concern about it. Yeah. It's still hard for the individual to spot these things. Uh, actually, it's very rare for Singapore to have a naturally mm. occurring sinkhole. So usually it's linked to construction activity. So the way to eliminate sinkhole is actually to have a very tight control in the construction activity, mm. to monitor any telltale sign from the construction activity side, to be fair, right? So you don't expect mm. human to be walking around uh, with an X-ray eye to see whether there's any Correct. void or sinkhole. It's not possible. Now that this sinkhole incident, obviously investigations are still ongoing, but typically cases like that, right, maybe it involves different companies or maybe very old pipes, etc. But how easy is it to actually figure out who's going to be responsible for it and to get things done fixed quickly and fairly? Is it going to be a very uh, straightforward thing or do we need to find better ways to, to solve these problems? It's actually more than uh, one party. Singapore is a very urbanised city. So in the same area, we have road, we have water pipe, we also have M Park walkway and so on. Uh, we also have a residential area next to it. So, for example, uh, repairing the road will be LTS uh, job. Repairing the water pipe will be PUB job. And then BCA is the one that oversees all the construction work that is all, uh, that is all around it. So all these parties will, will do their own part to ensure that the things piece together. Of course, they also have to work together and coordinate. That, that has been always the case whenever any project is done in this manner, all the agencies actually are involved in the approval process before the work can start. Actually. And Stefan, just sort of like moving forward, um, you know, what are some of the areas that you think can be tightened up or can be improved? I think more extensive soil investigations definitely will help to understand underground complexities. I think that's already done, being done. That's what David was mentioning in terms of creating cavities to be more mindful of sedimentary units that are quite unpredictable in certain areas. And I think, again, this knowledge needs further investigation because there was a recent look at Singapore's geology. There was a geological memoir that uh, was a part of uh, looking at the complexities and with help from agencies and external partners, we discovered that uh, Singapore has a very rich geological history. And with it comes our complexities and our uh, geological past. So I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe the density in terms of the resolution of boreholes when you do some soil investigations would help to try to picture what's really underground. I've learned a thing or two definitely about uh, sinkholes today. It is a complex issue. Thank you so very much, gentlemen, for your time and thoughts on this. To our viewers and our listeners as well, if you've got any feedback, uh, do drop us a note. Thank you so much for uh, listening in. And uh, once again, this podcast would not have been possible without our amazing team. Uh, I'm going to do a big shout out to Tiffany Ang, Junani Johari, Joanne Chan, Saye Win, Hope Ning, Nathaniel Fetelvero, Shaza Dalila, and Alison Jenner. I guess I'll see you again next week. See you then.